Support for this podcast and the following message come from Money Mind from Prudential, a podcast powered by your financial behavior. Hear insights from financial psychologists, experts, and more. Download and subscribe to Money Mind wherever you find podcasts and learn more at slate.com slash money mind. Take Ask Me Another and more with you with the NPR One app. NPR One finds the best from public radio and beyond. National and local stories, many of which have nothing to do with the election, and your favorite podcasts. NPR One is ready to make the holidays waiting in line or waiting for a friend better. Find NPR O-N-E in your app store. From NPR and WNYC, this is Ask Me Another. I'm Jonathan Colton, and I'm here with your host, Ophira Eisenberg. Thank you, Jonathan. This week, we're dedicating your favorite hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia to the power of literature. That's right. Why read books when you can just listen to us talk about them? It's much easier. It's kind of like an audiobook, except it's audio about books. We're going to be revisiting some of our favorite games about the written word, and we're going to be interviewing actress and author Lauren Weedman. She's going to be talking about her most recent book, Misfortune, Fresh Perspectives on Having It All from Someone Who Is Not Okay. Uh, Jonathan, how okay are you on a scale of 1 to 10? <laughs> 1 to 10? Yeah. I'm... Uh... I'm. I can't give it a number, but I'm okay, and everything is fine. <laughs> everything is going to be fine. So, in our first game, we're joined by puzzle guru Art Chung as we ask our contestants to identify famous books based on their actual one-star reviews on Amazon.com. Let's see how well contestants Jackie Backman and Spencer Owen do in this game. I sure hope you enjoy learning about whales. I swear, 85% of this book is various lessons on whaling, the origin of whales, whales' distinction, whale body parts, whale sperm, different color whales. Jackie. Moby Dick. Yes, you are correct. Eighty-five percent is about whales. That's you know you got a whole fifteen percent for the romance. (laughs) A little bit. It's like going to see Planet of the Apes and complaining that there's too many apes in that movie. (laughs) Right. First of all, it's nothing like the future is probably going to turn out. (laughs) Second of all, everyone says the author George Orwell is so trippy and weird, but I think he's just trying to cover up for the fact that he can't write. Jackie. War of the Worlds? No, <gasps> I'm sorry. Spencer. 1984. That's correct. The plot had great potential for making a powerful book, but Harper Lee's approach to writing seemed a mismatch. One can hear the plot wheezing by as it's being choked by Lee's attempts at cuteness and nostalgia. Jackie. To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes, that is correct. I wanted them to write, it has nothing to do with killing mockingbirds. (laughs) A great disappointment. Hardly any mockingbirds in this book. No instructional. (laughs) It might be a nice book if there was a story here. It ends with the guy Marlon Brandon. That's what it says, Marlon Brandon. Played in the movie Apocalypse Now, going crazy, and Conrad never explaining why there should be a fascination with him. Spencer. Heart of of Darkness. That's correct. Heart of Darkness was never going to be a nice book, ever. (laughs) The worst book ever. (laughs) Who cares about dogs in the Yukon? (laughs) Okay, a dog could really go from being spoiled in California to the best dog in the Yukon? Huh, believable, right? Take my advice, don't read. Spencer. The Call of the Wild? Yeah, that's right. Again, it's a novel. What are they uh, supposed to be fictional? It's not supposed to be real. Also, it's about dogs in the Yukon. Don't read it if you don't care about dogs right. in the Yukon, you dummy. And I've been to the Yukon, and it can change a dog, I'm just going to say. <laughs> yeah, right. All right? 
All right, this is your last clue. This book won the Nobel Prize. This book should be placed in solitary confinement for a hundred years. <laughs> this is to save both on time and trees used in printing of this book. Spencer. 100 Years of Solitude. Yes, of course it is. Well done. <laughs> Puzzle Guru Archung, how did these contestants do? They did great. And Spencer, you're moving on to the final round at the end of the show. Congratulations. Clearly not all writing is created equal, because on one hand you have Wuthering Heights, and on the other you have Twilight. You know, both are best-selling novels with difficult love stories. One's a literary classic, clearly, and then the other one's Wuthering Heights. And it's just proof that it doesn't have to be highbrow literature to be a good book. Are you a guilty pleasure reader? You know, I don't know if this qualifies as a guilty pleasure, but I found the Game of Thrones books to be unstoppably enjoyable. That's some serious high nerd cred right there. That, well, that's yeah. what I'm going for. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I like <laughs> your, like, Game of Thrones book. So I thought you were going to be like, you know what I enjoy? The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Da Vinci Code. No, I, <laughs> Dragon Tattoo is okay, but I found Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. My problem with that book is that they're constantly eating sandwiches. I feel like there would be some action, and then they would take a break and have some coffee and sandwiches. It got a little boring to me. <laughs> what, what kind of bread were they using? <laughs> yeah, so right. now I just want to know that. <laughs> So in this segment, we brought in Kevin Murphy and Bill Corbett, who are writers and robot puppets on the cult television show Mystery Science Theater 3000. And as you may remember, Mystery Science Theater 3000 was a hilarious TV show where a human and his robot companions watched bad movies and made fun of them. Kevin and Bill talked to us about their current project, Rift Tracks, which continues the fun by providing humorous commentary on all sorts of films. Then we quizzed them on the titles of some lower brow yet equally entertaining writing in one of our favorite games, This, That, or The Other. Uh, we essentially watch an entire film, yep. a short or a long film or a feature, and we do a commentary track in which we try to uh, make fun of whoever's on. I'm making this sound really dry yeah, and boring. Really, the key word here is wow. try to make it funny. That's right. <laughs> so we attempt. We, we dare. We actually succeed occasionally. We do. <laughs> so when you're in a movie theater watching movies just for pleasure, do you have to stop yourself, hold back from just yelling out all kinds no, of... No, I'm actually kind of a prig about that. I don't like talking in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to shush people who are oh, yes. like me. Yes. I'm the same way. When you pay money to actually hear the movie, that's fine. When you pay money to hear us then we will let fly. So, Kevin and Bill, I'm going to name an item, and all you have to do is tell me which of three categories that item belongs in. Because of your particular areas of expertise, today's categories are weekly world news headlines, choose your own adventure books, or actual movie titles. For those of you who are unfamiliar with some of these categories, the weekly world news was a supermarket tabloid that specialized in articles about aliens, the Loch Ness Monster, Elvis Sightings, and it now lives on as a website. The Choose Your Own Adventure books were a popular children's book series from the 80s and 90s in which the reader could make decisions that affected the outcome of the story. And titles of movies are titles of movies. <laughs> we're going to alternate questions between Kevin and Bill and just tell us, is it a weekly world news headline, a Choose Your Own Adventure book, or an actual movie? And the winner will move on to our Ask Me One More final round at the end of the show. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. We're going to start with Bill. Bill, purple squirrels on the rampage. <laughs> I, I want it to be a movie, but I don't think it is. Um, uh, choose your own adventure. No, I'm sorry. It's a weekly world news. Oh. <laughs> See, the word rampage is key here. I, yeah. <laughs> it could I be blew anywhere, it. I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, Kevin, uh -huh. chopper chicks in zombie town. Wow. Um, that's got to be a movie. That is a movie. That's correct. Yep. I auditioned, did not get a call back. <laughs> Were you going to be a chopper chick or a zombie? A zombie. Yeah. Try for the sequel, which is Zombie Chicks and Chopper Town. <laughs> okay, Bill, Prisoner of the Ant People. It's hard, right? Could oh. be anything. Movie. No, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I stink at this. It's a choose-your-own-adventure book. Wow. <laughs> wah, wah. 
It does right. sound like the worst adventure of all time. <laughs> like, of the ant people? Well, just, what I, kid shows that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kevin. The Dracula Fish Returns. Weekly World News. Yeah, that's right. Oh, man. Okay, Bill. War with the Mutant Spider Ants. <laughs> Movie. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a choose your own adventure. <laughs> the adventure I chose was great shame. <laughs> Are you sure you didn't pick from Choose Your Own Nightmare? <laughs> if you want to answer this question wrong, turn to page four. Uh, okay, Kevin. Deathbed, the bed that eats. <laughs> uh, I, I, there's been a lot of weekly world news, and it does sound like a, a t title with a colon in it, so I'm going to go for a movie. You're right, it's a movie. You had to get that right, didn't you? <laughs> it does seem like you can rule out Choose Your Own Adventure on that one. <laughs> right before bed. The right? bed that eats? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> just like... All right, Bill. Surfer ghost. Oh, no. Oh, no. I know. You're very gun-shy, I can tell. I am, yeah, I've been wounded. Uh, weekly World News. You got it! Yeah! King of the world. Uh, okay, Kevin. The San Diego Chulapa monster. Chulapa. Oh, I know about this uh, monster, and I believe this would be weekly world news. Yes, that's right. Okay, this is, this is your last set of questions. Oh, thank God. Okay. Bill, the great zopper toothpaste treasure. Choose your own adventure. That's right. Oh, thank God. I'm back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Kevin. Quacks or Fortune has a cousin in the Bronx. <laughs> you know, I, I'm seeing Matthew Broderick here. I'm going with a movie. It is a movie. Wow. Starring Gene Wilder as Quacks or Fortune. Wow. Gene Wilder, right in between the producers and uh, Willy Wonka. A little art movie. A little art movie. <laughs> Quacks her fortune. <laughs> well, our long national nightmare is over. Art, <laughs> Art Chung. Yes. Puzzle guru. What happened in that game? Well, we found out that Kevin has a subscription to the Weekly World News. Because <laughs> <laughs> he is our winner. Coming up, we'll sit down with Lauren Weedman, actress and author of the collection Miss Fortune. Fresh perspectives on having it all from someone who is not okay. Also, nonfiction books and the big screen collide in the movie trailer game for the ages. I'm Ophira Eisberg, and this is Ask Me Another from NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Thinks. Thinks period panties are a leak-resistant underwear that can replace tampons, pads, and cups on light days and be a backup to tampons and cups on heavy days. Thinks are reusable, machine washable, and are designed to be worn all day long with moisture wicking technology to keep you dry. Find a style to match your flow at shethinks.com and get $5 off with the code ANOTHER at checkout. That's Thinks, T-H-I-N-X. There's a new show at NPR, and it's a little different from what we've done before. It's called Radio Ambulante, and it's in Spanish, our first ever podcast in Spanish, in fact. And the show takes a look at Latin America and U.S. Latino communities, bringing you stories that you might not otherwise hear. Punk rock in Cuba, stolen books in Colombia, junk bonds in Puerto Rico. Hosted by novelist Danielle Alarcón, Radio Ambulante tells Latin American stories from the inside. Check it out on the NPR One app and at npr.org slash podcasts. You're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR and WNYC. I'm Jonathan Colton, and I'm here in studio with your host, Ophira Eisenberg. Thanks, Jonathan. So today we're bringing you a very special literary favorites episode. Writing can be lonely work. You know, it's just you, your laptop, your 
adult beverage. Yes, that's right. You're switching back and forth between Word and then Twitter and then Instagram and then Word again and then Twitter and maybe a little Instagram. Yeah, that's why people drive themselves crazy or they go off to murderous hotels in the mountains like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Well, it's true. Look at me. All work, no play makes Jonathan a dull boy. Wait a minute. Why does it say that? <laughs> I'm very interesting. Which brings us to this next game we played with contestants Abigail Elman and Ren McDermott. Puzzle guru John Chinesky joined us in a music parody game about lonely people. And it turns out a lot of those people are kind of a big deal in the literary world. Have a listen. Okay, your game is called Alone Together Like We All Are in Life. Uh, and it's a music game. Yep. Jonathan Colton. Thanks for that uplifting uh, <laughs> image, Afira. It's just part of this show. There's a hidden theme to There's this show. There's a lot of darkness in this show. <laughs> I'm right. enjoying it very much. This is a game about famous reclusive people. And each clue is set to a song that's about being alone or wanting to be alone. So name the recluse, and for a bonus point, name the title of the original song. So there's two points per clue. And if you don't know the song, your opponent can steal that point. Here we go. <laughs> Didn't like to write too much. Mostly short stories and such. Wrote a novel of stature. Title mentioned to catch her. Maybe call fields like myself. Oh, 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 oh. Abigail? J.D. Salinger. J.D. Salinger, and can you name and the song? And the song is Dancing With Myself. That's right. <laughs> Glad I'm alone now. The poems that I write, I don't show them round. At my Amherst home now, my sister Lavinia, guess what she found? Abigail? The poet Emily Dickinson. The poet Emily Dickinson is correct. Do you uh, know the name of the song? I think I'm alone now. Uh, yish. Um, uh, I think we're alone. Yeah, oh, okay. that's right. <laughs> when I was young, I had more books than anyone. Flying planes was just for fun. But now I shun All by myself I don't like germs All by myself Nails so long Thanks for that one clap, everyone. <laughs> I just want to say there were a lot of half diminished chords and that one it was pretty hard to play. <laughs> Does anybody know the freaking answer? Uh, Ren, Ren. Uh, oh, did somebody? Yeah, Ren uh, buzzed in. Oh, Ren buzzed in. Yeah. I didn't hear it because I was yelling at the I audience. Know. <laughs> you were like getting in touch with your inner Celine Dion. <laughs> Ren, what is the answer? Um, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes is and correct. All by myself. Yeah, you got it. Had a great sketch show, Tyrone, Prince, Rick, James, to name a few. But then I walked away, I'm probably never making half-baked two. Ren! <laughs> I think I'm really wrong, but um, Joaquin Phoenix? Uh, that is incorrect, no, I'm okay. sorry. Abigail, do you know what it is? Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle, that's correct. Do you know the name of the song? I Walk the Line. No. We walk the line. <laughs> it's not. It's not a That's pronoun like... problem, Abigail. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like the marching band version of a Johnny Cash song. Ren, I, this is highly unorthodox, so I'm not entirely sure this is kosher. But I think you can yeah. steal that point if you know the name of the song. Uh, lonely line. I walk the. <laughs> no, no. Also incorrect. We are looking for Bull Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Oh name, yeah, so. we, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I know. Okay, here we go. Just a comic strip I wrote about a boy. Imagination rules when he's with his stuffed toy. This kid believes his tiger is alive. People loved it, but I quit in 95. Abigail. Bill Watterson. Bill Watterson, that's correct. 
And the name of the song? Sending out an SOS. Sorry, that is not the name of the song. But that is a lyric. That is a lyric from the song. I will give you zero points for that. Ren, do you know the name of the song? No. <laughs> it's getting really heavy up once, here. Once I have a seed from her, then, I, then I'm, I'm lost. I'm thinking about ships and... She so, met, you're saying Abigail messed you up? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Blaming oh. Abigail. Can I, can I jump in again? No. Uh, Fourth sure, grade. If you want. I can't, I can't give you the point now, okay. but yeah, you can show how smart you are. Message in a bottle? That's correct. <laughs> this is your last clue. You'll be, you'll be relieved to hear. When I played Spassky, the Cold War was raging. I beat him, then left the spotlight. Something's not right. I was a grandmaster. I always won the game. I was a grandmaster. Twas chess that brought me fame. Abigail. Bobby Fisher. Bobby Fisher. Yay. Eleanor Rigby. Eleanor Rigby. Well done. John Chinesky, how did our contestants do? Well, John, Abigail will be moving on alone into the final round. Good job. I got to say, I feel like every book I've loved in my life has been ruined by the movie adaptation of it. Do you have books that have changed your life? Yeah, I guess I would say the book that has most changed my life is Dr. Atkins' Diet Revolution. <laughs> and it changed my life because it made me terrified to eat carbs. Yeah. Yeah, you know, my wife and I were doing that diet for a while, and somewhere in the middle, she said, <laughs> she said let's go out and treat ourselves to some sugar-free jello. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, please don't let's treat ourselves to sugar-free jello. Yeah. But let's, anyway, I... Let's go crazy tonight. <laughs> yeah, let's go crazy. Let's really... <laughs> let's... <laughs> But I do think that book would make a great movie. Oh, yeah. In a world full of carbohydrates, one doctor has the guts to wage war against the food pyramid. His only weapon, a stick of meat and some nuts and seeds. Yeah, see? I got goosebumps when you, when you did that. I would, I would totally watch that movie. Yeah, spoiler alert, uh, Dr. Atkins, he dies at the end. Uh, yeah, that technically is true. <laughs> well, contestants Marty Davidson, Sichel, and Bill Holsefell are the guinea pigs when we try to combine the fascinating world of nonfiction with dramatic film trailers. Our next game is called In a World. We love getting to theaters early for the trailers. So in this game, we've reimagined blockbuster-style movie trailers for some of our favorite nonfiction books. <laughs> for example, it might sound something like this. Trapped in a race against time, one pop sociologist and New Yorker magazine writer must search for the exact moment when trends and ideas become sticky and start spreading <laughs> like a virus. And to find out what that is? The answer is the tipping point. Okay, contestants, so we'll give you overblown trailers for famous non-fiction books, and you have to name the books. You don't have to give us the author. I mean, that's great. If you want to show off, totally fine, but we're just looking for the title. And remember, these are all non-fiction. The winner of this round will, of course, move on to our Ask Me One More final round at the end of the show. Here's your first clue. In a world where different genders don't always understand each other, two nearby planets will teach us all how to get along and fall in love again. Marty. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus? That is correct. <laughs> Let's hear the next question. In a world where he has nothing to lose but his chains, one proletarian will usher in the march of history and throw a party that no class will struggle to be invited to. Bill. The Communist Manifesto. Exactly. <laughs> Those party animals, Marx and Engels. <laughs> Guys are doing great. Let's hear our next clue. He thought he had it all figured out. Until now. One English naturalist will embark on the ultimate ocean voyage. 
and with the help of some finches and giant tortoises, discover where we all came from. Bill. The origin of the species. Yes, that is correct. That is exactly how I would say it. The title is actually The Origin of Species. Okay, next question. In a belief system where the errata can lead to spiritual bliss, one ancient Hindu philosopher will reveal everything you ever wanted to know about sex and won't skimp on the pictures. Marty. Uh, the Kama Sutra? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Sorry, I got excited. You said that. <laughs> Did you really get excited? You said it in a very sexy voice. I like that. You're like, uh. I'm trying. <laughs> Let's have our next clue. They don't follow the rules. They make them. An English professor teams up with a children's book author to explore... Language usage, composition, form, and spelling. And this time, it's grammatical. Bill. Strunken White's The Elements of Style. Yes, indeed. I know you've read that, by the way. You said it so confidently. Eh, I think I had it in college. Yeah. I cracked it maybe once or twice. This is your last clue. She was just doing her job, but the stakes were too high. Oh, yeah. Now, one female Facebook executive will rise up and encourage all women to stop holding back and angle themselves towards reaching their goals. Bill. Lean in? Lean in is correct. John Chinesky, how did our contestants do? In a world where only one can be victorious, Bill is that winner. Congratulations, Bill. Marty, thank you so much. You're a fantastic contestant. Bill, you'll be moving on to our Ask Me One More final round at the end of the show. Well done. Just listening to that game made me hungry, because now I'm, I'm craving milk duds mm -hmm. and like a tub of buttery popcorn right now. But I probably shouldn't because it's too many carbs. Yeah, you know what I do? I smuggle in celery sticks and rice cakes and a little Pinot Noir into the movie theater in my purse because it's healthy. Yeah. And I also feel superior to everyone else. Yeah, that's a nice <laughs> feeling. But I, I, I also am an expert movie snack smuggler. Did I ever tell you about... The time I brought in my own block of Parmesan cheese, and I had a, a grate or two. And so when I got the popcorn, I would just grate, yeah. The, grate yeah, the cheese yeah. over Oh, yeah. I've heard that story a few times. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's one of my favorites, though. Yeah. No, it's a good one. The When you grate it, and then some gets on the floor. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's high stakes. It's embarrassing. <laughs> it is harder to stack than when you're reading. Let's admit that. That's because true. Because you can't have popcorn. No. Pages are going to get all oily and buttery, and then you can't resell it on the internet. No, no, no. Popcorn is not a good reading snack. <sighs> Unless you have an e-reader, right? Then it's it's okay because you can just uh, take some rubbing alcohol and a squeegee. Yeah, you <laughs> clean it right off. That's why when I read, I like to read with a giant plate of nachos. Oh, oh, I am painting a picture. Relaxing night in, just you, your favorite book, plate of nachos for one. I guess it sounded less sad in my head. <laughs> anyway, hopefully this next game will give us inspiration for some literary-friendly snacks. Contestants Julia Rowney and Dan Durkin do their best to mix reading with culinary pleasure in this mouth-watering mashup game. So this game uh, that you guys are both perfectly skilled for, we think that Americans don't read as much as they should, but they love watching cooking shows. <laughs> so in this game, we are combining the two activities. We're going to give you a description of a famous book along with some information about a food or beverage, and you have to tell us what the mashed up new title is of each cookbook. Yeah, let's go to our puzzle guru, Art Chung, to give us a fine example of this. Yeah, let's give this a shot. Truman Capote's account of Kansas farm murders revealed a bone-chilling truth. The killers were a fan of a dish featuring finely chopped meat and congealed bodily fluids. The answer to that would be in cold blood sausage. In cold blood and blood sausage. But not all the answers will be that delicious. 
And here's a hint. The title of the book will always be first, followed by the food or beverage. All right, here we go. In Ernest Hemingway's classic novella, an aging fisherman struggles to reel in a giant marlin, then says, screw it, and kicks back with a refreshing summer cocktail containing cranberry juice, grapefruit juice, and vodka. Julia. The old man in the sea breeze? Oh, yeah. Finally, a Hemingway book with a happy ending. That's right. <laughs> Tom Wolfe's Chronicle of the U.S. Space Program describes how the astronauts were disappointed that the moon wasn't made of cheese. Instead, they were forced to use ricotta to fill their conch-shaped pasta. Dan. The right stuffed shells. Yes! Laura Hillenbrand's 2001 nonfiction book about a legendary championship horse reveals why he ran so fast. Waiting for him at the end of the finish line was a delicious southern breakfast dish <laughs> featuring round breads drenched in a savory sauce. Julia. Sea biscuits and gravy? Delicious and correct. Margaret Wise Brown's classic bedtime story features farewells to things we all have in our rooms. Two little kittens, a red balloon, and a southern treat made with graham crackers, marshmallow filling, and a chocolate coating. Julia. Good night, moon pie. Mm, yes. I feel like that's what you say to a moon pie when you eat it at midnight, right? Good night, moon pie. <laughs> Michael Lewis examines pro football through the story of an impoverished young player adopted by a family that offers him love next to a small dish of leafy greens with his choice of Italian or ranch. Julia. The blindside salad? That's right. This is your last clue. This Charles Portis Western features a 14-year-old girl seeking to avenge her father's death. With the help of Marshal Rooster Cogburn and some coarsely ground cornmeal boiled in milk. Ooh. Damn. True grits? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah! Well, for your both contestants, an amazing, but Julia, congratulations, you're moving on to the final round. Coming up, we'll be talking to Lauren Weedman, actress and author of the book Miss Fortune. Fresh perspectives on having it all from someone who is not okay. And then she'll play a game about unusual memoir titles. And get ready for an explosive ending. Our contestants duke it out in a final round about literary classics for the glorious Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. And look out for a plot twist. This is no ordinary final round. You've said too much. Stick around. Just a quick shout out to our sponsor who brings you this message, Zip Recruiter. They understand that posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all of the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Right now, Ask Me and other listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash another. If you've been enjoying this podcast and want to keep it going, well, the best way to do that is throw a little support to your local public radio station. That support allows us to keep doing our thing. So go to NPR.org slash stations to find your local station, donate a few bucks, and tell them we sent you. And thank you so much to those who have done this already. Again, that's npr.org slash stations. You're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR and WNYC. I'm Jonathan Colton, and here's your host, Ophira Eisenberg. And this week, we're celebrating an ancient form of storytelling, the written word. And speaking of the written word, we have a special guest with us. She's performed on stage and screen, starred in the HBO series Looking, and has published two comedic autobiographies. Her latest is called Misfortune, Fresh Perspectives on Having It All from Someone Who Is Not Okay. Welcome, Lauren Weedman. 
Thank you. Hello. Hey, thanks for uh, being with us on Ask Me Another. I'm glad to have been asked. Now, you have a new solo show called Tammy Slash Lisa From Misery to Meaning. Uh, can you tell us what that's about? So I, without being overly blabby about so I was adopted, and when I was born, apparently, I know my birth parents. I met them when I was 20, mm -hmm. and they're not together. But apparently, when I was born, they were both allowed to choose a name to put on some, I don't know, I guess a fake birth certificate they were just going to tear up. And my birth father chose the name Tammy, and my birth mother, <clears throat> excuse me, chose the name Lisa. And they didn't work together on this. They both just individually turned those names in. So <sighs> if they would have stayed together, they're like 15 years old, but if they would have stayed together and kept me, I would have been Tammy Lisa. And, and I was born in Terre Haute, Indiana, but I was, you know, adopted in Lauren Huntington Weedman, you know, just and oh, I was delivered yes. to the golf course, dropped right <laughs> off to the country club. And so the idea was like, no matter how I've tried to avoid certain, your real identity that like Tammy Lisa has been lurking, that there's two parts of myself, right. basically. Uh, I share something with you, which is we <laughs> have both performed, you know, autobiographically on stage and written about it. Now, I always get people coming up to me and saying things like, you're so brave. <gasps> that was constant when I was on the book tour, especially. Do you find it slightly a, a negative response or do you like it? When I first heard it, I got nervous, like, uh, am, am I brave? Is there something I don't know? Is right. there something behind me? And then as it kept coming up, I was like, well, wait a second. Would you say that to a guy? Mm. You know, then I got sort of like, it's misogynistic because I found it odd that just writing about my life was suddenly something so brave when all my you know literary heroes have done that a lot. That is a very good point. I mean, I had also people asking me what my mother thought of what I did, which I, I did take that as a little bit of, I don't think you would ask a guy, what does your mom think of right. what Actually, you do? It is odd because I, I, to me, I just want a good story. And the things that I wrote about was because I thought they were the best, they were a good story. And the, the title, fantastic, Misfortune, Perspectives on Having It All from Someone Who Is Not Okay. Uh, you know, it's a c collection of comedic essays. Now, on a scale of one to 10, how okay are you? I would say I'm a um, solid eight. Whoa! Yeah, and, and I'm when I started writing the book, I was way less okay. It was very much embracing, like, I'm, what a mess, what a... Th and then as I, as by the time the book was done, I've, I've gotten better. Because well, my marriage was falling apart when I was writing it, so it wasn't as, I wasn't a solid eight like I am now. Well, I find that very interesting that you started writing this book around six years ago. That's right. Oh, God. But it changed. So you were writing one particular story, but then halfway through or at a certain point through, you had to do a big revision to well, it. Yes. I started writing one book and I was the comedic crazy essays. And I, I felt like I couldn't, uh, that there was no depth to any of the stories. Yeah. And I was very frustrated by the book itself. And I turned in a draft and it felt so not it. And it turned out it was because I didn't know what was happening in my life. Like I kept trying to, like one of those things where you're so in the story that you can't write it yet. Sure. Yeah. You have no hindsight. Exactly. And I didn't even know what my story was. I thought the story was like, I think it just turns out that I just can't seem to connect with not just my husband, but anybody. Like, do, I don't think I understand anything anymore. Like everything was sort of falling apart. And then in the middle of the book, I found out about there'd been this like long-term affair that had been going on. And then suddenly all the, then I, re I saw the story where I'm like, oh, this is the story that I'm in. And it actually helped me write all the different chapters of the, or all different essays, even if they weren't exactly about my marriage, because I could think and see clearly. So in this book, you reveal that you are actually the youngest member of Weight Watchers. You went in the seventh grade. Is that legal? <laughs> yeah. No, my mother served four years in the California Correctional Institute. No, um, <laughs> no. I is it, I don't know if there is a an age. All I know is that it was very um, well isolating as a seventh grader to sit there and watch. I mean, everything that was talked about was like when you're packing your your kids' lunch and it's one Twinkie for them and four for Mama. You know and I remember thinking like, well, I, why, I don't, I don't pack my lunch for my child. I'm seven, seventh grade, <laughs> and I did a lot of sneaking off and going across the street to um, Wendy's to get a frosting. No, that's perfect. Yeah, I was going to say, how could you relate to all of those adult stories? But that's no. you were like, uh, no, I'm, I just gained weight and it made me hungry. Every time they'd show like the forbidden foods, I was like, oh, note to self, get that as soon as you're out of here. <laughs> Find a little Debbie. Now, would you say that you are more emotionally or candid about your life? on stage and on the page than you are, let's say, with friends and family? I think it's about equal, mm -hmm. I believe. I don't, and if anything, I was surprised by how hard it was for me to describe um, being sad. I guess because I, I go to the comedic stuff very easily. Sure. 
And this is such an old thing, right? Like, so hard for the clown to cry kind of thing. <laughs> right. But man, is it true? Because it was really difficult. I didn't want to bum people out. Oh, interesting. Right. And so, and you wanted to be able to use the comedy to take them to a different place. Yes, I wanted to entertain. Lauren Weedman's book, by the way, is Misfortune, Fresh Perspectives on Having It All from Someone Who Is Not Okay. Lauren, are you into an Ask Me Another Challenge right about now? Yes. Oh, okay. games are so anxiety provoking. I'm excited. <laughs> so people say the hardest part of writing a memoir is coming up with the right title. Uh, you have a great title. How long did it take you to come up with your title? Way too long. It yeah. was a it was a real point of stress. And then a autocorrect um, on my telephone uh, when I was texting, an autocorrect came up with it. Are you serious? Yeah, because someone was typing me. I-, I was complaining to somebody about what a bad day I was having, and he responded with, "I'm sorry for all your misfortunes." And then he goes, "Oh, that's so funny. When I tried to type it, it turned um, it turned it into misfortune." And he goes, "You should use that for your book." And I thought, that's a little obvious. And then I took it and sent it to the <laughs> <laughs> to the publisher. And they were immediately they were like, into fantastic. it. They were like, fantastic. Yes, they uh, were like, sold. Happy coincidence. Finally, autocorrect for good use. Mm-hmm. So in this game, Jonathan Colton and I will give you the titles of some memoirs. And some of these titles are real and some are fake. And your job is to tell us <laughs> which ones are real. Okay. Very easy. And if you get enough right, Vivian Leong from San Francisco, California, is going to win an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube and oh a copy of your book. Oh, God. So if I mess up, I bring down, I'm the, oh, God. No, you're going to be fine. No. I if love you, If you mess up, you're basically stealing a Rubik's Cube from some random I stranger. No. I know. T- if I mess up, if we, look, I'm going to um, um, send her a mug or something of my own collection. I can't I take it. I love that that's the first place you went. You're like, how am I going to disappoint everyone? Exactly. First of all, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, you're going to do great. We're going to read you the title. You just have to say real fake memoir. Are you ready for the first one? I'm ready. The Sex Lives of Cannibals, Adrift in the Equatorial Pacific. Real. It is real. Yes. Have you read it? I, it's funny you'd say that. I was just listening to it on, audio, on my audiobook on the way over. No, I'm just kidding. No, I've not read it. <laughs> um, so here's the next one. Incontinence Confidence, How I Learned to Let It All Go. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll say fake. Yeah, that's that's pretty yeah. fake. Yeah, that's pretty fake. It had a poopy, stinky kind of flair to it. You know what I mean? So, like, that just made me do a kegel. That book. <laughs> Here's your next one: Uber sharing advice from an Uber driver who's heard it all. Real? Oh, it's not. God, no! Thank goodness, it's fake. I'm not saying it's not being written. It's at least being pitched right now. I <laughs> can guarantee yeah, it. You know what? How I should have known it was fake is that it didn't have like a. I'm a grizzly bear. Like, it needs, like... You know, right. I, you know what I like is, I'm a grizzly bear, advice from an Uber driver who's heard it all. That's a pitch right there. I, when I said grizzly bear, where is that going to fit into the Uber driver? Uh, as a bear who like... drives a car, a lot of interesting stories are going to come from right. that. Right. Attacked by a grizzly bear, my Uber ride after. <laughs> Here's the next one. Winging it, a memoir of caring for a vengeful parrot who's determined to kill me. Fake. Is it fake? No, it's real. Oh, man, I should have... My instinct was that it was real. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really trying to listen to my instinct. Uh, it's, this book is about the author learns that parenthood is a lot easier than parenthood. Oh, what a blah, 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 squawk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. Here's your next one. Felt Way Insider. How a K Street lobbyist saved his soul by making puppets. Oh, oh I'm so... Um, I got angry at that title. Um, that's appropriate. It's fake. Oh, yeah, that's fake. You can't really save the soul of a K Street lobbyist. <laughs> this is your fake. last clue. A year without underwear, exploring the world on a bicycle. A year without underwear. I thought it was going to be like the tale of the yeast infection or something. <laughs> um, is it fake? No, it's, no, it's real. real. For his 50th birthday, a retired Air Force colonel takes a year-long 41-country bicycle tour. And I, I don't know where the underwear comes in. I feel like it's a sneaky title. They're like, right. okay, so there's four cyclists in the world that buy books. <laughs> right, but we'll yes. get all the no underwear fans. <laughs> there's I a lot me. of people that don't like, like underwear. Right, you want to like, I'm, I'm going to start titling all my shows like, you know, Naked Girls or something. That's you know, right. na- Lose weight, Naked Girls, free money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you did incredibly well. Oh, right. You, yes, it, it all worked out great, Lauren. Uh, you and Vivian Leong are going to get Ask Me Another Rubik's Cubes. That's right. We're going to give you one as well. Because you're amazing. And, that's incredible. And Vivian's also going to get a copy of your new book. Thanks for joining us. 
Thanks for having me. This was not painful at all. Was a castle by a waterfall With a pink and purple wall And a princess living there She had no parents and was all alone She got by on her own And she liked it pretty well Cause she never wore her socks She had a pet snake She bought a red guitar And she ate a whole cake And there wasn't anybody there To tell her what to do So she did what she wanted to Everybody knew the story of the princess who saved herself Princess who saved herself Was a dragon with a pointy tail He was bigger than a whale and his breath was terrible He scared the princess when he came around Tried to burn the castle down till she caught him by his tail And she tied him to a tree The dragon couldn't fly She told him he was mean it made the dragon cry when she finally apologized She offered him some tea, he accepted it graciously Now he visits every weekend with the princess who saved herself The princess who saved herself Thank you. We've done it. After a page-turner of an episode, we have actually reached the final round. Fear, are you one of those people that reads the last page of a book before you finish the book? I do. Skip if I, ahead. I do. If I get anxious, like in I the beginning. I don't approve of this behavior. <laughs> because you're reading a book in order to be taken on a journey. Why do you want to ruin it for yourself? Because I was the kind of kid who, when a movie started, I, I would be like, Does it, is everyone going to be okay? But do they, do they have time you, to you eat? You can't take the anxiety of the... Can't handle it. And then someone would just go, yeah, at the end, the dog is alive. And I'd be like, okay. Oh, okay, I can good. Now away. I can enjoy the story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this final round comes from an episode with Arrested Development's David Cross. He told us that he had a thing for trivia. So we decided to let him play like a real contestant. And he made it to the final round. The ending of this is so good. Wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't, just let's let them find out for themselves. Puzzle guru Art Chung leads this final round titled Sounds Like a Good Book. In this final round, every correct answer will be one of Modern Library's top 100 English language novels of all time, as voted on by both librarians and the public. As a clue, we'll give you a phrase that's synonymous or nearly synonymous with the title. So for example, if we said, a goodbye to guns, grenades, and missiles, that would be a farewell to arms. We're playing the spelling bee style, so one wrong answer and you're out. You only have a few seconds to give me that answer. The last person standing is our Ask Me Another grand winner. For your prize, you receive a bag of great IFC swag, some leftover broccolini that David Cross and Amber Tamblin had down the street, <laughs> and as a nod to Arrested Development, a pair of cut-off jean shorts autographed by David. <laughs> Suitable for you or the never-nude person in your life and they may have been worn by me in the shower. <laughs> Here we go. Drew, transparent guy. The Invisible Man. That is correct. <laughs> Christy, the noise and the anger. The sound and the fury. You got it. <laughs> Sergey, ruler of the winged insects. Uh, Lord of the Flies. That is correct. Jason, a book of maps slightly lifted its shoulders. <laughs> I'm going to have to give you three seconds. Jason, I'm sorry, step aside. David Cross. Atlas Shrugged. That is correct. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Jason is out. We're back to Drew. Courageous Modern Earth. A Brave New World. That is right. Christy, the nude and the deceased. The naked and the dead. That's right. <laughs> Sergey, a space enclosed by four walls with a landscape. A uh, room with a view. Right. <laughs> David, the year that Los Angeles last hosted the Summer Olympics. <laughs> 1984. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Drew, indigenous male child. Uh, native son. Wow, yep, that's right. 
Christy, 12 a.m.'s kids. Midnight's children. That's right. <laughs> Sergey, the Zinfandels of Acrimony. Uh, Grace of Wrath. Wow, you got it. He's really good. He's really good. David, the circulatory muscle is a solitary pursuer. The heart is a lonely hunter. Yes. <laughs> Drew, a pathway to the country where Mumbai is located. Three seconds. Um, the way to India. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I can't accept that. Let's see if Christy knows. Uh, the road to India? No, I'm sorry, that's not it either. <laughs> Sergey? Uh, journey to India? Oh, no! <laughs> David Cross, if you know the answer. Uh, wait, can you repeat it? Sure. <laughs> A pathway to the country where Mumbai is located. Oh, man. A passage to India. You got it! <laughs> David Cross, I you're our big winner. I decline the gifts. It's not fair. <laughs> it's simply not fair. David Cross, everybody. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Ask Me Another's house musician is Jonathan Colton. Hey, his name anagrams to Dow Jolta Cannon. Our senior supervising producer is Art Chung. Narc Thug. With additional puzzle writing by senior writers J. Keith Van Stratton, Josiah Madigan, Greg Lightman, Karen Lurie, and Kyle Beakley. Ask Me Another is produced by Mike Katzeff. Me Tika Fez. Travis Larchuk. Sick Hurt Larva. Julia Melfi. I'm Jail Fuel. Denny Shin. And his ends. Ramel Wood. Red Wool Mom. And our intern, Camila Salazar. That's me, Asia Lamazar. Along with Steve Nelson and Anya Grunman. Ask Me Another was created by Eric Newsom and Jesse Baker. We'd like to thank our production partner, WNYC. CYNW. I'm her right begonias. Ophira Eisenberg. And this was Ask Me Another from NPR. Now, I know if you made it to this point in the podcast, you are a fan of our show. Thank you so much. So, why don't you do us a favor and rate us on iTunes? Or better yet, leave us a review. Your support helps other people find our podcast. Thank you. If all of this high-minded literary discussion has you heading to the bookshelf for the library, guess what? NPR Books is here to help. The 2016 Book Concierge launches on December 6th. It's a giant list of our favorite books of the year. And you can scroll through or search with tags like book club ideas or seriously great writing. And hopefully you'll find your new favorite book. Check it out December 6th at books.npr.org. Next time on Ask Me Another, we find out about the future of the Star Wars universe with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo. And then we challenge him to a quiz about 80s action figures. Is that Slimer? Yeah, yeah that is Slimer. No pizza or donut is safe when he's around. So keep him away from the Michelangelo figure or else you've got all that tension right there. Join me, Ophira Eisenberg, for 